Welcome to another exciting episode and interview of Kung Fu Conversations. Today, we are joined from the land of cheese and chocolate, Switzerland, that is, from the fabulous Sifu Brian Cuddle. Sifu Brian, thank you so much for being a guest this morning. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. This is, uh, I've been looking forward to this. So this is, uh, I'm really, I really feel honored with the, uh, the names that you guys have been bringing in for your interviews and the different martial arts and just the way that you guys conduct everything. I, it's been something I'm, I'm really, I feel honored that I can share my art and my experience with you guys. We feel just as honored too. Thank you, sir. We do. Just like everybody else, we would love to hear what sparked that bug in your life, sir. <laughs> well, you know, I, I would say that my story is probably the most unique that you guys will ever hear. When I was a teenager, I saw a Bruce Lee movie. <laughs> and that was that'll it. Do it. That'll do it. Yeah. Well, do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nobody's ever done that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think so. I, w- I was thinking about this, uh, the, the real, like going back in my life and seeing where it really truly began. And I would say when I was young, it, the fascination with martial arts and, uh, more specifically like martial arts weaponry started with, uh, Ninja Turtles. And I was really into mm. that when I was a kid. And then it kind of grew from there. And, um, I ended up taking karate, uh, Shito Ryu style. It was done in my town and um, I took like a month and then I, we were done because I just couldn't pay attention. It was just not the right time for me. And uh, I made a video about it on my YouTube channel. Like it looked pretty viral. Like it was one of those, Oh, I quit karate. And it, but more or less, I wanted to share that story just to say that, you know, a lot of people think of, Oh, I should have started when I was a kid. What if I would have, I'm starting too old and, it's one of those things where you start when you're ready to start. And I had the opportunity, but it just wasn't the right time. And uh, from that point on, not much had gone on. Uh, not until I was a teenager. And I, it was even kind of before getting into Bruce Lee, I got really into, I, it was a book report I had to do for uh, my high school English class. And I thought, oh, I'll just pick, you know, something ridiculous. And um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I happened to find at a thrift store a copy of the amazing, um, oh, what's it called? Secrets of the Ninja by Ashita Kim. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Classic. <laughs> and that's, yeah. I was like, oh, man, you, you learn how to, you know, crack somebody's back in this book. And I, you know, I wanted to make a book report about it. And at that same time, one of my friends had a pair of foam nunchucks. He did like Taekwondo and there was a nunchuck section in the book. And I actually learned some passes and some strikes from that. And that became kind of my book report was making a video of me swinging nunchucks. And um, one of my other friends in class was like, Oh man, that's so cool. We should make a movie together. We should do like samurai and ninja. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So he got together with a bunch of, like other martial artists in our high school. And uh, we were going to make this movie. He wrote a script. And then it was, uh, we went to like meet and choreograph this fight scene. And uh, one of the other guys did karate at the school that I quit from. And he was already a black belt by that time. He was, you know, almost, he was 17, 18. And uh, we're getting ready to do something. He's like, oh, and then you you should throw a sidekick. And I was like, well, I don't know how. And he, he's like, well, just, you know, just stick out your leg. And I was like, well, can you show me? And he's like, no, 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 I can't. I can only teach my students. And I was like, it hit so hard. And and I was like, man, I got to get some formal training. And it that's where I really wanted to actually start taking classes. And then around that time in with another group of my friends, I saw some Bruce Lee movies and it was like, I had to do only kung fu there was nothing else it had to be kung fu and uh luckily where i was growing up in the nearby city uh, um, i grew up in the sierra nevada mountains and in california but the closest city was reno and uh there was a kung fu school there and i didn't know anything about the style i just knew it was kung fu so i went or i called up and and uh they ran pretty good business you know they called me back set up like an introductory private lesson and then a couple of 
group classes after that. And like after my first lesson, I was hooked. I walked into the school. It looked just like the movies. They had canvas mats or they had the mat area was canvas covered, kind of like a boxing ring. And then they had this wall of weapons and they had a wooden dummy in there. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. And then the instructor there was very professional. He was very good. Um, he, he got me hooked as well. And, uh, I, there was no turning back from there. I didn't realize that it was a Choi Fudd school for probably a good few months where I was like, oh yeah, what style is this? And all of that. But it was, that's, that's pretty much where it took off. And then, um, at, throughout the years, I enjoyed uh, learning there. I moved up to the advanced ranks, and they suggested I started teaching. So I started helping out and teaching, and then um, it that took me through college. I was working and going to school and then also teaching, and then I got to a point where I was done with college, and I had to make a decision on what I was going to end up doing. I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to pursue, if I wanted to take take it a step further and go into a grad program or to um, just look towards working. At that time I was working at a lumber yard and there was not really much progress there. I mean, you had to wait for somebody to quit <laughs> to actually move up. And uh, so, yeah, I, I thought, you know what, I'll just kind of take the summer off and go train at my grandmaster's school because I had been to seminars at the school. We had hosted him for seminars and uh, my grandmaster is Doc Fai Wong. And you'll, you'll probably hear me call him Doc Fai Wong or uh, Grandmaster or Seagong. But um, yeah, he's based in San Francisco. And uh, I, uh, I was like, ah, I'll just go out for a summer. So I emailed them. And his son was the acting Sifu in the school. And he emailed me back. And he was like, well, what, you know, I know you have teaching experience. Um, but what do you think about actually coming here and becoming program director our current program director is leaving and we're looking for somebody and i was like oh my god this is awesome yeah i'd love to i'd love to just go full on into this and so moved to san francisco um in 2008 and uh never looked back from there <laughs> just kept going training teaching and uh being at the school all the time and and uh getting really immersed in the Kung Fu community, being up close with my role model. Like I, I was around Grandmaster all the time. I had looked up to him long, like for a really long time. Um, mm -hmm. we, they have a forum on his website, plumblossom.net. And I think you can still access it. But if you go to that forum and there was, a, there was a time where he would answer questions. People could just ask questions like the majority of the questions were being asked by me. Like I had so many entries and so many questions for him and I had all, you know, as many magazine copies as I could get with his columns and his articles. I had his books. Like he, he, um, he was just really cool to me and, and uh, to go there and become close to him, like on a personal level was really, really something I never would have expected, you know, like to, uh, you know, drive him to his appointments or, you know, help him with, uh, cause he also does feng shui and, you know, help him with feng shui appointments and things like that too. And just picking up so much, you know, like just driving him in the car or, or after class going to dinner with the instructors and talking with him. So it just, it was a really, really fortunate time for me. And, uh, yeah. And then now here I am in Switzerland since 2018 and, and continuing to teach and, and do that. And I still talk to Grandmaster all the time. Um, we talk over WeChat. I actually just uh, co-authored a book with him, too. So like, still, you know, and then I see him when he comes out to Europe and he does seminars. And when I go back to the States, I always fly into San Francisco to when I go visit my family. So I always make sure I stop by the school and see him and see my Sifu as well. So. Yeah, I would say that's kind of the, the big overview and the origins. But um, I think it, one thing, too, <laughs> I should have mentioned, it's not my only martial arts experience. So doing Choi Li Fa, doing Yang Style Tai Chi, I started that back in Reno at Tiger Kung Fu Academy. But prior to that, um, I was doing some wrestling and it wasn't necessarily um, like freestyle wrestling. It wasn't something I would call a martial art. But um, it was more to connect to my heritage. So I actually am Swiss. 
my grandparents moved from the United, they're from, moved from Switzerland to the United States. And, wow. uh, there's quite a big Swiss population in California. So we would do Swiss folk wrestling and it was kind of every summer we would do it. Um, it's a, <laughs> it's an interesting style of wrestling. It is a sport. I wouldn't consider it martial art because of it is very rules based and the confines of those rules don't give it the, um, the, you can't, it's not applicable to like self-defense situations directly. Like there's no, you, you start already connected. You don't start separated and it just doesn't translate directly over. There has to be something supplementary to that, but it gave me some invaluable insight into body mechanics, leverage, things like that. And um, in Swiss, it's called swinging. And I know a lot of people get thrown off at the name. They probably they they either stop there when they hear swinging, <laughs> or they see what it is. Because I would I would relate it similar before. I would have said it's close to judo, except for you have to have points of contact and leverage. So you have to have specific grips. And it's not something that you would use like from the lapel or the sleeve. And I would say actually now it's, it's more, it's similar to like, uh, book or Mongolian wrestling, not even as much Shui Jiao, but more like the Mongolian wrestling, you know, how they have the jacket that like thick jacket. And that's the point of contact that you have to have with the other person. Um, but yeah, Swiss wrestling is done in a sawdust ring really traditional there's no mats it's just sawdust that's breaking your fall and you have um kind of like how they have a jacket in shui jiao or bulk you have a pair of like burlap shorts that you put on over your pants and you have to have a grip at all times one is back on the belt the other one is on the the leg of the the shorts and that's... the round goes that as long as there's one grip you can you know, it uh, it goes on, but as soon as both people let go of their grips, the match is started over. Once the shoulders, t- once both shoulders touch the ground, match is called. So if you get taken down from standing, it's ten points. If you get taken down to the ground and then rolled over, then it's a nine seven five. If you tie, it's nine five, and then if you lose, it's nine points. And a tournament's like six rounds in the day, and it just goes winners versus winners, losers versus losers, all the way up to that sixth round. And we would do a tournament. We would host a tournament in my hometown once a year. And then in the Central Valley of California, there were a couple other Swiss clubs that would host tournaments. On the West Coast, there were some up in uh, Tacoma, uh, Washington. And then I think in, in Eugene, Oregon, there may have been one, but I never went out that far. But I think having to have that point of leverage and take somebody down like that, you really learn manipulation of somebody's center of gravity. You learn the feeling like if... I, uh, a lot of my students, what I tell them is, especially when it comes to throwing techniques, is that the feeling of a throw, when it's that perfect throw, is going to have that same effortless feeling, that same connection as throwing a perfect kick or a perfect punch. The energy should feel seamless. It should feel effortless. It should, when it, when it all goes together correctly. <laughs> Of course, it's not always going to do that, and uh, there's a lot of extra force that people try to do, but it teaches you a good amount of explosive energy. And as far as once it gets to the ground, there was a little bit of maneuvering to get somebody up on their shoulders. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it was it's been a very beneficial sport to my understanding of martial arts as well, and uh, especially for takedowns and and whatnot. But uh, yeah, that's it. It's a trip. You should look it up. I I did it. For about 10 years, from probably 8 to 18, and then I stopped. <laughs> I did it maybe once after because uh, it is – there's no weight class. It's by age. And then once you turn 18, it's 18 oh. and up. So I was, what, like a buck 50 and wrestling these farm boys from the Central Valley that are throwing bales sure. a day. Yeah. And they're just, <laughs> just dropping us. So it, it was uh, it was a good time to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Have you thought about looking it up uh, since you're over there now? It's so they don't they they don't do they don't have many clubs that do that on this side of Switzerland. I'm in the uh, mm. French side, but yeah. they still have a lot of clubs that do it out in the German side. And uh, my wife and I have gone to to watch some tournaments. We got to see the big one that happens every three years. It's the big championship, and uh, but they, it's really cool out here because you go 
up into the Alps and you'll be in this beautiful mountain picturesque location. You know, people are in, there's bleachers and stands. People are watching. They're having, you know, beer, pretzels, sausage, and just watching these dudes wrestle. And they'll bring in the grand prize, which is like a cow. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then they have these huge bells that they give as prizes as well. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool. We've been to a couple out here, but I'm definitely not to uh, compete. Those days are long gone. <laughs> we were all younger men once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sifu, um, since 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 you're you're our first Choile Foot guest, could you tell us a little bit about Choile Foot, please? Yeah, so it is a Southern style art, and um, this it came out around the time of boxer the Boxer Rebellion. So it was um, it's it basically. <laughs> There's some people that like to tout it as like, oh, it's the original mixed martial art because it's a mixture of three different arts. Yep. The uh, founder of the art, Chen Hong, uh, he studied first from his uncle and then he moved on to another instructor. And then after a few years, moved on to another instructor. Um, he learned he started first with Choi Ga and then Li Ga and then finally Phut Ga. But uh, to pay kind of homage to all of that, he he wanted to just make it call his art Choi Li Fat. So I don't know enough about those three arts to actually be able to pick out what was pulled and from when. And by this time, you know, the art has evolved so much that it has become a completely different thing than those root arts. Sure. So it is a uh, forms-based art. I know some of the people that you guys have had on before that anytime forms comes up, it's like, oh yeah, well, you know, it's not as many forms as those Choi Li Fat guys. And uh, it's true. I mean, we do have like, and certain lineages have a lot more. So um, in in the Plum Blossom Federation, where I study under Grandmaster Da Fai Wong, we have something like 200 forms. And okay. it is something where obviously nobody's going to be able to just regurgitate 200 different forms um, at once. It's more so that over time, people instructors wanted something that they wanted to have a legacy. They wanted to share their particular take on training or techniques. They created a form and it just got passed down through the system. So I, um, like I, I do love forms. So <laughs> we'll, I think <laughs> we'll get into that <laughs> a little bit later, but, uh, yeah, I mean, at this point I would say, um, I would be around in the seventies of, of forms and of hand and weapon forms together. I would have somewhere in the seventies and uh, it's, it, it's definitely like, it, I think there's a lot that I've learned also just in the past few years, looking back at more cultural influences as to why we would have certain forms or certain weapons, because there could be some, some things that you would consider like redundancies, but there are, um, I, th- I think it, I think everything is there, and they do have their reasons for being there. But Choi Fat altogether would be your um, really signature uh, Southern style. It's all about low stances. It's got kicking, striking, sweeping, joint locking um, techniques. Nothing on the ground. It just wasn't what they wanted to do. There's uh, hands and weapon or hand and weapon techniques, two person forms. And uh, it really, it, when you look at the fundamentals, it's very solid. You know, a, a lot of people like to think that, especially because, you know, you get your, uh, uh, there were those times where Wing Chun and Choi Li Fut were rivals and people wanted to simplify it as like, oh, you got straight lines versus curves, you know, like Choi Li Fut was known for their big sweeping techniques. And looking at the system, as far as I've seen it, there is just as many straight line punches as there are <laughs> swinging punches. So you can't really... Um, try to <laughs> simplify it like that. But um, it's definitely known for its sweeping techniques. The So Choi is one of the ones that you can hear from Southern styles. So, oh yeah, Choi Li Fat, they have this big So Choi, this big swinging hook. But um, yeah, it's got a lot to it. Um, a lot of people look at it and, you know, you could probably say it's close to Hong, Hong Kun, but I think that when you under, when you know both arts, you can see there's a big distinct difference in how um, the energy is released in the strike. So Choi Li Fat has more of a follow through, whereas Hong Kun will stop 
And uh, something simple is like a back fist. You would see like a home coon back fist. Once they throw it, it's fast and it'll stop here. But when toilet foot strikes, it'll follow through and let the movement continue all the way through, which gives it more of a big sweeping look. And uh, the power is, is thrown a little bit differently because of that. But the technique also is very much the same. It's a hanging fist. It's a back fist. So I would say that's how you can separate those two. But yeah. So what would you say in terms of your particular lineage? Like what are the, what, what are the unique things in your lineage in terms of, you know, it could be body mechanics or it could be, you know, fighting, fighting ideal or what, you know, whatever, um, you know, what are the things that you think are unique? And then, you know, what do you, what are the things that you like? Um, well, what I would say is unique as far as, uh, the lineage for, like being under Grandmaster Doc Fai Wong in the Plum Blossom mm-hmm. Federation, it would be that he, we, we actually technically have three lineages that we have in our system. So he went, and it, it's important to know his history. He, he grew up in San Francisco and he started taking Choi Li Fat from Lao Ban. And Lao Ban from the Hong Sing Pun, he's a big name in Choi Li Fat in the United States. Um, that has its origins in Fatsan. And it is a very distinct style of Choi Lu Fat. Um, and he studied there for uh, quite a few years. It was towards the end of Lao Ban's life. So, I mean, he would go after school and he would train hours a day and then do it every day. And uh, so he got as much as he could. And then when Lao Ban passed away, he uh, decided that he was going to go teach on his own. And then after a few years, he met up with some other Choi Li Fat practitioners from another lineage. They were just doing a big Choi Li Fat um, get together and banquet. And he saw that there were a lot of forms and there was a lot more out there that he didn't know. So he decided that he wanted to learn more about the art. You know, he, he was a young man at that time and he wanted to further his study in it. So he ended up going to Hong Kong and looking for Choi Li Fat practitioners. He had uh, his wife's brother lived in Hong Kong and he could stay with him and then he would go uh, around mainland and then the Hong Kong area and ask to try to find these Choi Li Fat masters. And it was at a banquet for Choi Li Fat that he actually ended up running into two in particular. Um, one is Wong Gong, who is still alive and he's out of Jiangmen City in southern China. Uh, and the other was Hu Yun Cho. And um, both were super influential. Both were really good. Like he knew that they were the real deal and both represented different lineages of Choi Li Fat. So, mm. uh, uh, Wang Gong represented the Jiangmen lineage. Um, and Hu Yun Cho represented the Ging Mui or the Founders Village lineage. So he studied, Hu Yun Cho studied from the Founders grandson, I think it was. But, um, basically he wanted to learn from either of them. And again, this was back, you know, at a time where uh, Hu Yun Cho, first off, wasn't, was known to not take disciples. And Wang Gong, um, he did take disciples, but it was, uh, it was something where, you know, if you were to study from a Sifu, you don't study from anybody else. You, you know, you yeah, only want Sifu, yeah. right? So uh, it was very exceptional for him because at that banquet, he talked to both of them. They were, they happened to, I believe, I think, I don't know, you can't quote me on this one. I think they were at the same table. I'm not sure. But they ended up speaking between themselves when he wasn't around. And they actually both decided that they would accept him simultaneously. So this was agreed upon by the both of them. Wow. And wow. that was huge. Like he yeah. spent... He would go back to San Francisco. He would teach the Hong Sing Choi Li Fat that he learned from Lao Ban throughout the year. And then anytime he could get out of the city, he would leave, go to Hong Kong, and then go work and study from those guys. And um, he did learn some forms from from uh, a student of Wong Gong, one of the Sisuks. Um, he did learn some forms from there, but he also learned, you know, the the Jiangmen style. And then he also, for Hu Yun Cho, he was a um, acupuncturist and a Chinese medicine doctor. So uh, Grandmaster shadowed him all day at the clinic and then would also learn how to uh, learn Choi Li Fat and Tai Chi from him 
at night and actually Wudan as well. So he definitely made the most of his time in learning this. And what that did for, you know, my students like me is that it provided us access to three different lineages. And that's why we personally like, or that's why our federation has so many forms because mm-hmm. we have Fatsan, Hong, uh, Fatsan Hong Sing, we have Jiang Men and Ging Moi. And uh, I think that it, it's been kind of cool to see over the years, because obviously you're going to have the same names and the same types of stripes, but at the same time, there's going to be some differences in how things are done from one lineage to the next. Sure. And I have in my time seen um, certain techniques taught as so almost a standardized version of the technique um, uh, for like when we have a coiling strike, Kun Q and, or a coiling, uh, coiling uh, parrying or coiling bridge. And at first it was always done the same way, same shape. You, you circle the hand around and then the palm is facing out at the end. And uh, then I think at some point he decided that it was more important to keep the lineages true. So if you were learning, if you were doing a form from a specific lineage, you had to do that style of that technique. So when it wow. came to differences, you would have to do the, the, we would just, when usually when we would do forms from the Fatsan and Hong Sing, we would just say Lao Ban. So we would always talk, you know, we'd do the Lao Ban staff form or whatever. And this is Lao Ban Kun Q or, a, you know, a Lao, Lao Ban So Choi was a different way of doing it as compared to the Jiang Men way or the King Mui way. And at first it was weird because I only knew the the one way that we had standardized it. And I was like, oh man, I have to remember this for this form and that form. But I mean, you, you do it for like three months, you get over it. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was not so bad. And I think it's, it's interesting too, because it leaves you with a different way of completing the technique, depending on your hand position, depending on the emphasis of the energy one was more like a, a circular parry while the other was more of like a snapping, uh, dropping kind of a strike with the palm at the end while another one would fling out or one was just really like stiff arm or something, you know, you'd run into something like that. So it's, uh, that I think has been really special about this lineage and, uh, just having the, the, the ability to trace back the roots to these things and see where those forms came from and, and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, Choli Fat though has so many different lineages. You have like the Buxing Choli Fat. That's yep. the, the, the little, the Buxing is like, um, it comes from the, a northern district, which was called Siubuk. And I, I, I can't remember if it was in Guangzhou or if it was in Fatsan. But the school focused mainly on, on uh, techniques rather than on forms. Mm. So they got the name, um, the name Hong Sing comes from like a revolutionary term. It was Qingming, you know, dyna- like during that time where, you know, the, they wanted to bring back the Ming, overthrow the Qing and uh, anti-Qing <laughs> sentiments. So Hong Sing was one of those things. And it's known as Great Victory. But when people started to realize that was a rebellious name, they changed the character and it looked like instead of great victory or great winning, they changed it. So it said goose winning or goose victory. So it, but it still had the name Hong Sing. So um, there's a really, you know, kind of random, but interesting part of that. And uh, yeah, like uh, Buck, Buck Sing comes from the Subak district, which was little North area. And so that's just kind of where they had their own buxing kind of to go like a home scene and it continues today. And I know for sure there's some good schools in the Bay area, the, the Lacey family, they've been keeping it strong. So, and then you have Jinhui um, or the Sanboy branch of Choi Li Fat is in China, in the Sanboy area is, and it's very close to the founder's village. So they have a very distinct style. A lot of uh, very strong, big swinging arms. Um, there is uh, Sifu Wong in New York is a great example of that. And a lot of people have seen his forms because he is super fast when he does it. So if you ever see like uh, there's videos that are like, you know, crazy Choi Lei Fat form or super strong Choi Lei Fat form, it's, it's him. He's doing the Ping Kun <laughs> form. Huh. But uh Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think I've, I've done enough <laughs> into that. No, that's, 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 <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, 
Yeah, that was, yeah, I love that. Thank you. Would you say that, um, like a lot of the higher level seafoods in the plum blossom, like you're doing, <clears throat> they keep distinct forms. Like, like you, like you have 70 forms. Is it, is it just by order or are there are certain people that are like, you know, Sifu, I'd like to learn this. I'd like to learn this. You guys kind of keep certain forms and that way keeping it alive and you can go to different people and talk to it or how does that work? Yeah. Do you know? Sifu? So it, it's, um, well, the way that it kind of balances out is through the curriculum and, and supplementary training seminar forms and whatnot. So, um, there is a standardized curriculum. There is a specific order. But there's also some flexibility in that. And that's something I saw over the years is that some schools might not have access to Grandmaster or even, you know, my Sifu or his son, Jason Wong, to get the, to, to be able to learn some of those forms, especially in the higher levels. So there, there is a chance that there may be some, I don't want to, more or less substitution forms. So if you're, you know, you, you would learn a different hand form in, instead of a two person form or perhaps a weapon form, depending on your situation. But, uh, so there is some flexibility there, which is nice. But, um, if you do, like you can see it, it's on plumblossom.net. They have the curriculum laid out and it's listed everything out through there. And, uh, if it's not in that curriculum, it's taught usually through seminars and, and still seminar forms can be advanced level forms. I know I learned quite a few way ahead of time just by taking seminars and mm -hmm. it was, it worked out for me. I know like some people kind of think, you know, it's, oh, why, are you, why are you trying to go and, you know, learn an advanced form, just learn it when it's time and blah, blah, blah. But it's not necessarily the, what you're picking up in that. Because there have been forms that I've learned that were way ahead of my skill level. And uh, I had to just kind of put them on the shelf for a few years and come back to them when I was ready. But um, being able to experience working with Grandmaster firsthand or, or his son firsthand made so much of a difference. And being in the Reno school, Reno is not far from San Francisco. It's like a three and a half, four hour drive. Not so bad. Not bad. Like it's, it's accessible. Sure. But yet that distance still, when I moved from Reno and I went to San Francisco, the first year of classes, when I was taking instructor class and I was getting corrections and getting details on forms that I thought I knew, it was blowing my mind. Every single class, just the details that had been missed. And it's, and it's not by the lack of trying. Like we would try to get as, as best we could, but not being able to be in contact and, and see these things specifically taught or experience it, you, uh, you do, you do miss those things. So it's, it's really important to be there. That's awesome. So what, what would, what would a typical class look like? You know, if let's say, you know, you know, beginner intermediate and to your level, what would that look like when you were training out in San Francisco with, uh, Sifu Jason and, uh, Grandmaster Doc Fewon. So um, each each level is is different. Um, from the beginner level classes, we did put a big emphasis on conditioning. So there was we would have a pretty solid warm up, like doing you know push up, sit ups, uh, back raises, you know the core. <laughs> That was always my favorite thing to say in class was, you know, <laughs> it, you, when you work your core, it's not just the front, it's the back. You got to have the six pack and the backpack. But because um, <laughs> it's Chorley Foot is like very much a lot of waist rotation. There's a huge yeah. emphasis on waist rotation and then just general leg strength. So reviewing your stances and doing many stances after another, doing those low stances is going to develop the leg strength doing your push-ups and sit-ups, that's all maintenance. That's basic maintenance just to be able to uh, keep yourself from hurting yourself once you start throwing these punches and swinging big. But yeah, we would do a solid warm-up, a lot of exercise like that, then some stretching. Uh, this is all together with the group. And then we would do, um, we would focus on specific themes throughout each month. So depending, uh, that was something that I really liked too, was because it's standardized across different classes. When you have different instructors teaching, they could still be under the same theme because we had about a dozen instructors when I was there and when I was running the school. So, um, we would work on techniques that would fall into that particular theme. 
whether it be pad striking to develop power or partner conditioning, doing three-star um, arm banging exercises or uh, joint locks or whatever, we would, we would focus on that area. And then for the last, you know, third of the class, we would focus, we'd break everybody up in their specific level and work on their material. So the instructor, usually we would have the main instructor for the class and um, I would be there as program director. So I could always jump in and help out. Or if we had an assistant instructor, they would join in and we would grab whoever was around for the instructors. And then we would work with the groups, you know, working on their specific forms, their specific material. And then we would bring back for the very last part, we would do, um, you know, a a very specific technique. And that's usually when we would introduce self-defense technique or something like that. But we tried to make sure that each class, they got their good workout and conditioning. They got, um, you know, something to explore in the arts together. And then they had their individual work. And if we had time, which most times we were able to manage, we would do something like a self-defense technique that would lead into uh, sparring or push hands or something like that to more the the, the freestyle uh, type of sparring. As you get up into the intermediate level, you, you know, you, you guys have students, you know how it is. <laughs> They're not on the same, not every student is as gung-ho as you are. So even at the intermediate level, it's important to review earlier forms. So rather than jumping in and doing like our, you know, whatever conditioning it was, jumping jacks and push-ups and sit-ups and all that stuff, we would use the review of earlier level forms um, because it is a forms-based system. We would use our earlier level forms as the warm-up. And then you would get through the certain amount of forms. Then you do your focus of maybe it's on a weapon or, or something like that, that theme for the month, do that partner drilling and training. And then after that work on their individual forms. And we would take more time to do that and spend, you know, that time we would do that till the very end of class, because that's usually where you get your most diversity is in the intermediate levels. And then for the advanced level class, we would do more of, um, the, the beginning as well, we would do similar as the intermediate class. We would review forms for uh, to, to make sure that they retained everything. And then we would do uh, two-person forms because by that point, it, by the point they're advanced, they already have three or four two-person forms. So we would, you know, do the form, change partners, do the form again, change partners, do the form again. And during that time, we're covering refinements, um, paying attention to specific details. And then we would then work on their individual forms. And if we had time again, in the end, we would start going into our uh, more freestyle applications. So push hands, or we call it choily foot sparring, but it's basically just a freestyle sparring without the gear. So it's not Mm -hmm. full knockout power. It's more of a chance to index and work on grabbing and striking with whatever it is. And, you know, it's, it's very, it's very, uh, relaxed. So you could go into joint locks and takedowns, but we wouldn't spend too much time on the ground once you were there. We did have other supplementary classes, like our, we would have sparring classes. And a lot of times we would talk about how techniques that they're learning in that class, whether beginner, intermediate, advanced, how they could use that into sparring or how it fit whatever the theme of sparring was. And then our sparring class, you know, it would also have its own particular theme for the month, whether it be spinning techniques or um, just developing power or developing cardio or whatever it is. And um, and then the whatever techniques we wanted to focus on in there. And then we could always just kind of tie everything in together. So that was another way to, to encourage students to get into sparring and uh, join in that class, because it was more or less at that point that was additional. You know, it was not. They, it was optional. They didn't have to go to that class to progress. They did get their kind of freestyle training in their regular group class. So if they wanted to come in, they could get a little bit more out of sparring. And we definitely encouraged it. But again, not everybody's into that. So, And at what point in, in, in that, in the, in the curriculum you just were talking about in the different levels, did, did you start introducing weapons? So weapons are usually introduced in the early intermediate level. So, um, it's already a good, I want to say four forms in that you learn your first weapon. Uh, it's unless you do a seminar, <laughs> but sure. otherwise it's uh staff. It starts with staff. 
and um, and then it's single end staff, and then you learn broadsword, and then butterfly knives, and then once and that pretty much takes you up to the advanced level. And then once you hit advanced level, then it's like a crazy dump of weapons on you. You're doing spear and bench and double broadswords and um, the double end staff. And I mean, we have 53 weapons in the system, so it just all of a sudden you hit with like double axes and and hook swords and chain whips and things like that. So it does pick up a lot. <laughs> you guys have the, do you guys have the melon hammers? Yeah. 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 That's, oh, uh, <laughs> they're awesome. Awesome. Yeah, you know what I was thinking? Yeah. Cause you do, uh, you do your club training and your mace training. Yes. And they have, um, that kind of similar weight to them. It, I, the only thing is the, the melon hammers, the form that we have, I would say it's, it's not, very um the skill level for it is not very advanced it's something that is pushed towards the advanced level just because it doesn't fit in very well with the um earlier forms but it is uh i wouldn't say you're doing anything too complicated uh there's there's i think people will add in going around the head when uh like an umbrella block style for a certain section where you are doing like a block and then a strike just to, to get some variety in it. But most of the time it's like forward thrusting, but that's a, it's a cool weapon. And I think it's so funny too, because this is something I've been getting into a lot lately. It's looking at the history of weapons. At one point I wanted to, I, I kind of started writing a book about the the different weapons in Choi Foot, but I, the level of knowledge I had back then was just barely surface level. Now I have a lot more knowledge of weapons and techniques. And we, we have such a representation from like wushu and performance, like Chinese opera influences that people lose melon hammer techniques. Now you see a lot of people choking up. So their hand is like right behind the melon itself on there because they're, they're really, it's a weird balance when the melon hammers are the wushu style and this giant like melon sized <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. uh, bulb at the end real like the traditional the real wartime melon hammer the the melon is like the size of your fist like that's it oh, wow. like that's the size of the hammer it's not much bigger than that and i have a set that are made like that they're they're still not 100 percent. i would say accurate because it's a it's a hollow pipe that connects it to the handle so it, it doesn't have that full weight to it i think What's probably better and even closer are the double, they're, they're called gan in Cantonese, but it's like a long, I, I think they're sometimes classified as jian, um, the other name of jian, where it's the sword breaker style, but they're also like the, the really long cudgels and they have like the dragon head on the handle and it's usually like a, like a kind of ribbed or spiked coming out. Mm-hmm. And those ones, those are just solid. There's no other way around it. Those ones, that's where you get the, the real weight to that. And I think that's where you get a much better or closer effect to like the, the mace training and whatnot. But I'll tell you as far as getting close to that, um, it, it's not necessarily exact because it's, it's uh, it just, you're using both hands and it's more similar to a, uh, I can't remember what the bag is called. It's a popular thing now. It's kind of picked up. I think even on it picked it up. Uh, it's some kind of a like the it's a Bul- Baltic Bulgarian bag. Bulgarian, Bulgarian bag. bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's similar to the Bulgarian bag. Is is just using the the kung fu horse bench, the the wooden bench. A sure. lot of those techniques and stuff. You're going around the yep. head. You're doing these lifts. Yep. Um, I think I think it's a very close um, weapon. But of course, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it started out as 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 common tool of self defense and then it became something that you can really develop strength from but i i think that's where it has its limit it, it eventually does uh plateau where the bulgarian bag can go further but it does have its similarities there and i i use the bench training more specifically for like that for my own strength training <laughs> that's awesome any favorite weapons oh man that is a that's a hard one <laughs> There's, uh, like, I've, I've always loved the sword and, uh, I was always, I always liked the saber look. I was always into swords, but I have to say one of the weapons that kind of surprised me is the, the three section chain whip because Mm -hmm. I, I 
I liked the flexible weapons, and I even before doing martial arts, like I, I like I did the nunchucks for the, for that ninja book report, <laughs> and then um, I got I made my own three section staff, and I was looking up on the kung fu forums like, what do you do with it? And I remember there was like a, a post that said, oh well, our warm up was you know doing like jump rope with it. So like I did that for a little bit and I was like, well, this doesn't really teach me anything. <laughs> I've got a good jump rope, a good rhythm. <laughs> but then I just kind of started playing around with it and uh, learned a little bit. And then later on learned it in the system. And I thought, man, this is going to be so cool. But I didn't love that form. I didn't love that weapon as much as when I learned the three section chain whip like that. It, it's something where I felt like. I, I, I don't know a better way of explaining it other than like, I felt like I was flying, you know, like I just I felt so free using it. And, uh, I, I hook swords is up there, the double hook swords and, uh, double broad swords are up there too. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. There's so many weapons. I like them. <laughs> I love weapons. And that's why the system is so great for me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And, and do you have two person sets? Yes. For each we- yes. For, now for each weapon or no, is it just unfortunately. Some, some weapons? <laughs> yeah, just some weapons. Um, we do have, there's a big emphasis of spear versus weapons. Mm. Ooh, which, yeah, yeah. Looking at it now, and especially since I've been doing, um, uh, I've been delving more into weapon history because of the stuff that I've been doing with LK Chen and looking back into like Ming dynasty manuals and and things like that. There's always been a big emphasis of learning how to defend against a spear and Mm -hmm. in looking at the system and a lot of the two person forms that I know um, for weapon wise, besides like there's staff versus staff, but doing broadsword versus spear, double broadsword versus spear, three section staff versus spear, and even spear versus spear. It's very spear heavy when it comes to the two person forms. Mm. Um, there are some other ones in the system that I, I haven't learned them. Um, there's some that have like the horse bench versus the like farmer's hoe. You know, like that would be oh. interesting to see sword and shield versus trident some cool ones like that. But uh, as far as the most part, we put a lot of emphasis in our curriculum on the, on the spear versus whatever. 